Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm talking about ride comfort and ride handling and also my thoughts on the car after seven and a half thousand miles. So the suspension. I was unhappy with the suspension of the car. I found the ride was extremely wallowy and going round bends the back end was stepping out of line. I noticed that on several occasions and I was not happy with that. As per my previous video on this I talked to Vehicle Handling Solutions. Uh, the guys there used to work for SAIC till the department was taken in-house in, Ch in China and they were made redundant. And so they know the car inside out. One thing we noticed that was when going round the bend uh, the rear suspension would load up and was be almost up to the bump stop and then when you hit a bump and because it's a torsion beam everything is transferred across the vehicle from one wheel to the other but the car just jumps out of line which was not very pleasant at all. A bit scary actually. So these new dampers they give the back end an awful lot more control. You'll never get rid of the torsion beam side of things but the torsion beam on this car is pretty stiff and it's pretty good. Uh, they were talking to me about it when they were here uh, fitting the dampers. They have developed a set of dampers and so they came in February and fitted the dampers to the car and it transformed the handling of the car. The ride comfort was pretty good but low speed handling wasn't very compliant around town. The car felt really stable at 50, 60, 70 miles an hour and I was really impressed with the, uh, the quality of the ride and the handling at those speeds. But at low speeds uh, every time you went over a bump the whole car moved. There was not really much give at low speed. So I lived with those for a couple of thousand miles and to be honest if that was my only option over these original equipment dampers I would have lived with that uh, ride comfort uh, because of the overall package was so much better than the original equipment dampers. So the rear dampers are now acceptable. The front dampers didn't really feel like they had much damping at low speed. So they went back to Bill Stein and made some adjustments to the front dampers and then they came back in July a couple of weeks ago and changed the front dampers over. These front dampers have a lot more compliance at low speed. We thought they were going to lose a lot of the high speed feel and preciseness but surprisingly it's still just as good if not actually better and I think the reason for that is it's a bit like on my road bicycle where I used to have the tyres set at 120 psi which was the maximum allowed for those tyres. I did it for minimum rolling resistance and to make the kit bike faster but actually the bike ended up more in the air than it did on the road because of the uneven road surface. So I lowered the road bike tyres to 70 psi and they've got a lot more give in them now. It's low enough to give a lot more ride comfort and give in the tyres makes the bike a lot more comfortable to ride and it means that the wheel stays in contact with the road which is my point here that with the revised dampers they have a lot more give at low speed and the wheels are staying more in contact with the road rather than bumping up when they go over a bump at low speed which makes the car safer and you're more in control. I've now driven on these dampers for about 700 miles. I've driven down to Devon using motorways, dual carriageways, single carriageways, A roads, B roads and unclassified roads and roads where you can't see round the corners at 15-20 miles an hour and it's just been amazing. I'm just really really happy with the revised front dampers. So the fronts I think are pretty much there now. So huge huge improvement over the original OEM dampers and I would highly recommend if you can afford it to update the dampers to these Bill Stein dampers. They've also had a side effect because they are monotube as opposed to twin tube and that the tubes are 40 millimeters diameter rather than 22 millimeters diameter they've had the effect of stiffening up the front end which means steering is a bit more precise now and it's got a bit more feel makes driving the car much more pleasant. Now you're going to ask me about cost well to give you an idea 
on cost. The other day I googled Kona FSD, which is similar to the Bill Steins, for the BMW Mini, which has been around for a good many years. There's many thousands of them on the road and fitted they were about £700 a set. Now the MG ZS EV is going to be more expensive than that simply because it's a niche product and it's a niche market and they're never going to sell very many therefore it's just by that very nature it's going to be expensive. Quite how expensive I don't know at the moment we will find out soon. Bill Stein are extremely busy with a big backlog due to the COVID-19 shutdowns that they've had at their factory like everybody else has so it's going to be a while before they get any dampers into stock for sale to the general public. In the meantime I'm still testing these and giving them feedback every few hundred miles but say overall we're very happy uh, the ride is nice and compliant now Yes, it will still crash occasionally when you hit a big pothole, but any car would do that. I was driving another car the other day and that was banging and crashing far worse than this was on the previous set of dampers. So I'm very happy with the car. I'm glad I made the decision to change. So this is my third electric vehicle. I've been driving electric vehicles now since January 2015, so that's over five and a half years. I've driven over 70,000 electric miles and I would not go back to a petrol or diesel vehicle given the choice. I find that the electric drive and the way the vehicles drive suits my driving style perfectly. I like the MG because it's sitting slightly higher up than the average car. It's easier to get in and out of for my aging bones and um, my wife prefers driving it compared to um, the previous two electric cars we've had. So she's been doing quite a lot more miles in the car just recently, especially whilst I've been off sick. But now I'm back driving, but she is still doing some of the driving. Right, this is just a brief video of my car. So that's the near side, left hand side. The air conditioning is on. And there's your confirmation that it's the ZS EV. Here's a view of the inside, the airbags on the front seats, that's the shaft. Now I've got to a WSB socket there and then there you've got the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto and the spare USB there. You've got your glove box here. And next base 522GW at the front. Rear seats, it's a lovely view out of the um, sky roof and you can barely tell that the inside win the windows are tinted on the inside. The rear passenger window has got an 80% tint and the front has zero, is just standard clear glass. And the rear has got a 70% tint. And that little window also has a 80% tint. Or as you can see from here, it's definitely tinted. 
the rear passenger window is tinted but the front one isn't and the rear window here is definitely tinted. Here's the rear view camera and that's the only thing I've had to do to the whole car for fitting all the bits that I have done so far. It's just cut a little notch in this black plastic trim for the cable to come out. And then you've got this little, I've just made a slit in the rear rubber for that. So it lifts the whole floor up and inside the boot I've got a telescopic ladder and underneath that I've got my spare wheel. I've got my granny charger, I've got the gunk, I've got the compressor, I've got a spare type 2 cable and my boots. This National Trust sticker, it's barely noticeable through the tinted rear. Okay, rear seat belts are all strapped up because I rarely have anybody in the car and it just helps with the start-up sequence. And that's beeping at me because the car is on and I keep on opening the doors, but at least it's only a small beep. Card slot for keeping, well, my National Trust card. And here is my Polar card. Could actually do with more slots for all the cars that we need as EV drivers. So there's the airbag and the shaft again with the electrically operated driver's seat with no memory. Door switches, door lock with my range of 89 miles left and I have five graticules or blobs on the 20 degrees outside which is a nice number to know and I have got a screen protector on there which stops it reflecting so much. Okay not noticed this before probably because I haven't looked but here there's a right arrow and then there touch that button and it turns off the screen so if you don't want the screen on at all there you go just tap on the screen and it comes back or if you press and hold the button it goes to the screen saver so it's still the system's still on tells you the time the temperature and what all the HVAC controls are doing and um, Bluetooth saying it's not connected updates on the car it's had the comfort to upgrade which has made a huge difference to the driving it's a lot quieter experience. You don't have all the bongs. It's just the slight chime, I suppose, is the best way of describing it now. Uh, the startup sequence is quicker. You've got the outside temperature gauge on the infotainment system, which means that I've actually removed the temperature gauge from which I did a video for a few months ago. There was no point in keeping it because it's already built into the car and I much prefer an OEM look. You've got the GOM range to empty on the bottom left hand corner of the information pack between the speedometer and the power meter. That is brilliant. I found it very useful when driving down to Devon last weekend. Yeah, using MG Pilot now is much better. It's a lot quieter. Yeah, I still have issues with MG Pilot uh, when it lets go of lines it doesn't warn you other than the lines disappear on the display if you cross a line without signaling it just lights up that line in red it doesn't give any audible warning also if you had a heart attack and you stopped holding the steering wheel you get the orange steering wheel sign and a chime and then it goes to red and the chimes get louder and louder and closer together it then switches off lane keeping and then the car just carries on in a straight line and you will then crash into a barrier, another car or a tree or something. 
I don't think that's a good idea. I think the way that the Nissan do it with their pro pilots is a much better idea where you let go of the steering wheel, it warns you, it insists on warning you until it gets to the point where it says, okay, you're not holding the steering wheel any longer. It slows the car down slowly and puts the hazard lights on, still keeping the car in its lane, uh, which I think is a much better way of dealing with it than the way MGD will deal with it. So MG, sort it out, please. I used to get in and out of the car a lot without switching the car on, and it was a right pain because the car would bong at me for 30 seconds every time I opened a door. It doesn't do that anymore, which is brilliant. And it doesn't do the triple horn beep when you get out of the car or somebody gets out of the car before you do, after you've turned it off. So you don't annoy your neighbors at night. So that's all the comfort update. So that's transformed the ownership of the car. So the car now, from when I bought it in November, is a much more pleasant place to be. And I'm much happier driving it. Overall, I'm very happy with the car. Real world range, I am drove to Littlehampton, motorways, A roads, B roads, C roads, uh, the normal mix and um, we did 137 miles and I arrived home with 20% left. We were doing 60, 65, 70 in places on the motorway. The real world range in this weather is definitely very, will be very easy to hit the 163 WTLP figure and so I'm quite happy with that but I'm typically getting sort of four to four and a half miles per kilowatt hour at this time of year on the motorway, probably 3.7, 3.8 at 70 miles an hour. But I don't tend to drive at that speed most of the time because it's not very economical. It costs me more. I know electricity is cheap and I'm on Octopus Agile tariff and I use the OMI cable to charge the car up at night using the Agile tariff and that works incredibly well. You just tell it how many miles you want to put in the car and you work that out by when you plug it in, the display tells you how many percentage you've got left and from that you can work out how many miles you want to add. The Omi app actually a, gives you a percentage and the number of miles. And then I just put in the number of miles I want to add and then it does it for me. I've set it to greenest, looking after the battery and you can set the maximum pence per kilowatt hour that you want to pay per kilowatt hour as well. It's very cheap to run. Typically, I, it's costing me less than 2p a mile when I'm charging it up at home. There are a few issues at the moment with Genie Point chargers. Yeah, they'll only charge it at about 20 kilowatts, which is means you'll only put in about 20 kilowatts in an hour. We used another fast charger. I used a Shell and that put in 23 kilowatts in about 30 minutes, which is a much faster rate. And that was only on a 50 kilowatt charger. The Genie Point was also supposedly 50 kilowatts, but there's problems there. I don't know quite what the problem is with the MG. There are also problems with polar chargers. They seem to get a translation or transaction error at around 30 minutes or so of charging, and it just cancels the charge. Sometimes you get billed for it, sometimes you don't. It doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason at the moment. And it doesn't seem to happen with all polar chargers, just some of the ultra chargers. Ecotricity chargers are a bit hit and miss in my experience and only generally have a maximum of one if you're lucky at any motorway service station. Though there may be three Chedimo at places like Cobham or South Mims possibly or Beaconsfield where they're very busy, but I say only one CCS. And even Nissan now is moving over to CCS with their new Aria EV that's just been launched. That looks to be a good car, by the way. And it can tow up to one and a half tonnes. Anyway, that will be subject of another video to another date. So I'm very happy with the MG. No, it can't tow. No, I can't fit a tow bar. Maybe if I talked to the insurance company and asked if I could fit one so I could carry my bicycle on the back rather than on the roof or inside, but I haven't gone down that route yet. I've changed the inside lights to LEDs. That's the lights up here and the one in the boot. 
I've changed the reversing lights to LEDs because they were pathetic, the original ones. I'm experimenting with LED headlights, but I'm not happy with the beam pattern of the ones that I've got at the moment. So I've put the Osram Nightbreakers back. I've got the scuff plates for the doors and I have ordered some in for the rear bumper as well. The windows have been tinted behind the B pillar 80% and the rear window is 70% and next week I'm having the front uh, between the A and B pillars tinted at 30% which is the legal maximum because I found I was getting sunburns when I was going to and from Devon and so I want some UV blocker and I might as well have a subtle tint there as well which brings it in line with most other cars that are sold these days they have a tint to the windows these ones seem to be just completely clear my tinting company won't do the windscreen because he doesn't want to get the electrics underneath the window at the front of the car wet. I asked about having a clear UV film put there to try and reduce the heat input into the car but he refused to do that because of the electrics. I'm glad I made the decision to go for the exclusive over the Excite model because I use the car for work. I'm doing 18 to 20,000 miles a year. In the first four months of ownership I did six and a half thousand miles that's my normal sort of mileage uh, obviously because of the lockdown I didn't use the car very much and um, I'm now up to seven and a half thousand so the reason that I like the exclusive I love this sky roof and it's also got the roof bars so you can put a roof crossbars on and carry stuff on the roof it's got the vegan leather style seats with contrast stitching it's got blind spot detection and rear cross traffic alert, which I found very useful reversing off my drive. It's got the reversing camera, which is very good. It has electrically adjustable door mirrors, which automatically close on locking and unlocking. And they are also heated when the rear screen is turned on. The front seats are heated. The driver's seat has six way electrical adjustment but it doesn't have any memory setting. It's got six speakers with 3D sound as opposed to the four speakers which are only in the front on the Excite model. And it's got rain sensing front windscreen wipers. Most of the time they're okay. And of course, part of the comfort update now is that the auto high beam has a switch on the infotainment system, which means it can be turned off. So if you're not happy with it and you just want to use it the old fashioned way and do it yourself, then you can. Those few items, I think, to me, were worth the expense over the standard Excite. At the time, it was £2,000. I think the difference is still £2,000. MG are doing some good deals at the moment. I would refer you to dealers and their website for the current deals. So. I'm impressed with the MG, it's a very good value car. It's much improved over the vehicle that I bought back in November. Suspension aside, it's a much better vehicle with the comfort update. Um, I say I've done a few bits and pieces. I've got a few more ideas for things that I'll do at a later date. And the suspension has just transformed the ride and handling of the car. And I think it's fairly safe to say that this is probably the best handling and ride comfort MG ZS EV in the world. Thank you for watching. Speak to you again soon.